Good morning, good afternoon to all of you who have tuned in for our discussion of US-EU relations. I'm Karen Donfried with GMF, and I am delighted to be joined by Anthony Gardner, former US ambassador to the European Union under President Obama, and Juliana Schäuble, US correspondent for the German daily Der Tagesspiegel. I am thrilled that GMF is helping launch Tony's new book, Stars with Stripes, the essential partnership between the European Union and the United States. We want to discuss the trajectory of transatlantic cooperation from the past to the present with all of you. And I want to make a pitch for Tony's book, which I have read. It is impressively substantive. He divides the book in three big sections where he looks at economic ties, security ties, and saving the planet together. And he weaves those substantive issues in with a deeply personal narrative that I found compelling. And if you've tuned into this session, it means that you, like me, would enjoy reading this kind of a book during a pandemic. So don't wait for the holidays. Pick it up now. Take it with you as you fill your hours during the pandemic. I am also delighted Juliana is with us because we very much wanted a European perspective to be a part of this conversation. I am being informal because I know both of them well, so no disrespect intended, but I will be going by first names. This session is on the record and we invite all of you to ask questions. You'll notice there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Just send in your questions and please do note your affiliation and, and where you're based. Um, and I will try to work in as many questions uh, into the discussion as possible. But the first thing I wanna do is give the floor to Tony Gardner to share with us the central argument of his new book. Tony, over to you. Thanks to the German Marshall Fund of which I'm proud to be a non-resident fellow. And thanks to you, Karen. We were of course, former colleagues at the NSC for a while. And I have this memory that I was telling you before of Kerry's speech, you know, in October of 2016, he came to Brussels and delivered a speech which the GMF hosted uh, at this historic place, the Concert Noble in downtown Brussels. And it really um, made an impression on me as I was thinking about the relationship and I was writing this book because the GMF hosted uh, Secretary Pompeo in the same place two years later. Um, anyone interested in the differences between the two administrations about Europe and the EU should really read those two speeches because they are at polar opposites. Um, I just wanted to be very brief about what this book is and why I hope it's still relevant because the world has changed so much uh, just in the last few months. Um, I knew it was going to be a tough job. You know, when I drove off on January 20th, 2017 from the residence and we were speeding off to Bruges, the College of Europe, where I spent three months, you know, I was thinking to myself already that someone uh, at some point should write the story of this relationship in a non-academic way. And I say that because there are a lot of terrific academic books out there about the EU. But I didn't, I haven't found any book that described the relationship um, uh, from the perspective of someone who has been a diplomat and uh, has dealt with some of these issues in perhaps a more practical way. And so I said, well, maybe I should write this book. And when I announced to my family that I was going to do this, my 16-year-old daughter, as she then was, said, don't do it. Uh, it's going to be boring. Uh, no one's going to read it. Uh, and you should focus on making money to pay for my school fees. And, you know, she had a point because writing about the EU is hard. Tom Friedman put it so well. I quote him in the book. And, I, and, and he said that the surefire way of making people fall asleep is to put the words European Union in the title of an article. So how do you write a book that describes this relationship in, a, in a, what is, I hope, a readable way, but is also, I hope, a, a substantive way? Uh, 
All of you on the call know, of course, that the Trump administration has departed from 70 years of bipartisan US foreign policy with regard to the European Union. And I say that because uh, some people have been somewhat critical in saying, well, you've been rather partisan in parts of your book. My answer is that I'm not partisan. This is not a partisan issue. EU, US you know, relations should never be a partisan issue. I would argue that it's Trump that's jumped the rails from, as I said, 70 years of policy. And that is uh, sad and it's also unnecessary. It's been counterproductive because it's, uh, it's just created a lot of damage in the relationship. Um, you mentioned the structure of the book, Karen, and indeed this, the book is structured around nine different areas in three different buckets, if you will. The first bucket is the economic relationship, which of course is so critical. Um, and economic relationship trade being the most important. Um, and I was very involved in the TTIP negotiations, which unfortunately we didn't conclude, but not just trade, uh, also data privacy. Uh, and I walked into a, a pretty tough time with the uh, Snowden revelations having happened just before I arrived. And we had to deal, as you remember, Karen, with the consequences of that. And I feared it would poison the well. It would stop us from getting anything done across the board. It didn't luckily happen that way. And then of course, there's the digital economy issues, which are vast. And I discussed some of them and they will continue and they will be fundamentally important to both of our economies going forward. And the second bucket relates to security relations. And here, uh, you know, even though I knew a little bit about the EU when I arrived, I was uh, positively uh, surprised that we do so much on law enforcement cooperation with the EU. Of course, we've, we've done it with the member states for a long time, but specifically with the EU and Europol. And I went to The Hague three times and I saw in a very granular way what we do or with the EU on combating serious crime and on combating terrorism. But it wasn't just, of course, about law enforcement cooperation. It's about energy security and what we've done together with the EU and of course the member states and in improving European energy security on which a lot has been done, um, particularly on security of supply for gas. And it's also of course military and security cooperation. And here again, I would say I was surprised positively that we do have a substantive uh, cooperation with the European Union, yes, on security matters, which I didn't fully appreciate. And I was surprised when four-star generals, as I recount in the book from the AFRICOM, would repeat to me, we value the EU's contribution, particularly in Africa, in security and military. And perhaps most importantly on sanctions, which I lived through um, during the period of time when we had to uh, implement uh, biting sanctions against Russia and roll them over, re renew them every six months. And that's an unsung success story, in my view, uh, what we were able to do. Of course, it's true, as I recounted the book, it was the downing of the Malaysian aircraft that really um, you know, propelled us to take uh, serious sanctions against Russia, but we did a lot together. And the same with Iran. I would argue that those sanctions would not have been as effective without the contribution of the EU. The third bucket of the book relates to saving the planet issues related to um, climate change, of course, and I get into some history in that chapter. And the history is necessary because it puts into perspective how much we were able to do with the Paris Climate Change Accords, because in the 1970s, the United States was actually leading on many environmental initiatives. Then of course, the EU took over leadership in many aspects as the US withdrew under Bush and uh, subsequently. And then we had these remarkable eight years during Obama in which more or less we were aligned uh, and together we exercised leadership on climate change issues and that drove success in Paris. Uh, and also on foreign aid, humanitarian assistance. I lived through that in a rather personal way. Certainly on humanitarian assistance, I saw how the US and the EU cooperated belatedly but effectively in combating the Ebola crisis that broke out in West Africa in 2014, 2015. And I mention that because, you know, I, I was struck um, when thinking about humanitarian assistance and what we did on Ebola, how little we have done uh, in dealing with the current pandemic. And I want to get to that, and it's an important issue because I unfortunately had to hand in my manuscript in February 
before it was clear what Corona would do. Um, I thought back on a, a document which I was involved uh, in drafting, the 1995 New Transatlantic Agenda signed at a US-EU summit in Madrid. And uh, it was the last thing I did before leaving, leaving the White House. And in that document, uh, we specifically state that we should work more closely together on uh, fighting the re resurgence of global pandemics. And we mentioned AIDS and, and Ebola. But little, of course, was done in the subsequent 25 years. And there's so much that we could be doing uh, together in combating um, the virus. And unfortunately, this, this White House hasn't uh, thought about that. Um, so, you know, despite all of the uh, fr fractures and the fragmentation that this crisis is exacerbating uh, in the EU, and we're all witnessing it, um, financial fractures, the euro skepticism, uh, disputes about how to uh, finance um, the, the, the economic um, growth um, going forward, and the problems we're going to have with our debt overhang in the United States and the, in, in the EU. Um, you know, despite all of those challenges, my argument would be that this relationship still is indeed uh, essential. Essential to deal with global challenges and essential to deal with regional challenges. Uh, and I'll just conclude by saying, you know, on global challenges, um, climate change, if anything, is even more pressing. We've lost four years, and there will be no uh, possibility of getting to an agreement without US-EU co-leadership on this issue. On trade, I would argue, yes, we're going to have a, a difficult time because of cynicism about multilateralism and cynicism about uh, extended supply chains. Uh, we're going to have populism living with us on both sides of the Atlantic, but God, we we cannot draw from this crisis the lesson that we need to get rid of all the benefits of free trade. So uh, I'm cautiously optimistic that if Joe Biden wins, there are things that we can actually do together, even on trade, that could be quick and effective. I, uh, one of those things would be, I would argue, elimination of uh, tariffs on industrial goods trade. Um, so those are the global challenges. And then on regional challenges, they haven't gone away either. And the EU remains, I would argue, an essential partner, whether it's Iran um, or uh, the Balkans or making human rights and anti-corruption and good governance uh, fundamental principles going forward and combating uh, you know, certain types of populism going forward. And there's a whole host of other issues. And of course, foreign aid, humanitarian assistance uh, in a time of budgetary restraints, constraints. Uh, of course, we're gonna have to continue our cooperation. Terrorism hasn't gone away. So the EU remains an essential partner. Um, so I think the argument of my book, uh, even despite Corona, uh, I think remains, um, remains valid. So I'm a believer. And I think that if we have a change of administration in November, God willing, there is uh, quite a bit of damage we can repair, and we should go back to learning the lessons of the past, Karen. That's essentially why I wrote this book, in, in part maybe to remind people what we have done and what we could do together. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tony. You made a compelling case for why this relationship remains essential even during the time of the coronavirus. And Juliana, I'd love to bring you in for a European perspective to both reflect on the argument that Tony has crafted and think about what the implications of it are given our current volatility and what the future looks like. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Karen and GMF, and uh, thank you, um, um, Anthony Gardner, to accepting me. It's a little bit intimidating to be, a co to be like uh, announced as a counterpart to somebody who knows Europe that well, who loves Europe apparently that well as you do. Um, you have Italian um, roots, so um, how can I compete with that? Um, I'm very happy to be here. And um, first of all, I have to tell you, your book is readable and subst substantial. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot to learn. It's a lot, uh, um, it's, it's super interesting to, to recapitulate it, how it all happened. And, um, what, what I really liked, uh, one of the comparisons in your book is Europe as a window pane, as something that is not valued enough when it's like perfectly functioning, when it's clear and you, can, you don't even recognize that it's there. So um, you make the argument we, don't, we did not value enough what we had when the times were better than they are now, um, that we did not 
um, um, cher um, cherish enough the accomplishments uh, the EU uh, has done for its people and for the world. So it's really good to have a reminder of, um, of the importance of this union and me being German, um, uh, I think I know that it's important and I, I, I consider myself to be a European. I consider myself, of course, being tra a transatlantist, um, living in the US and uh, loving this country, even though there are problems uh, we are all facing. Um, and I think the, the point you make about the lack of emotions uh, we had in the, in, in the debate, this boringness about the EU, that is really a problem. And I think that's a problem we all have to, to face and, and to find a way of making it more interesting, especially to the young people. And we saw it in the climate protests that there is excitement. There, there are um, young people who want to be engaged and want to work uh, together. Um, worldwide. Um, so there is hope. Um, and I think that's also a theme that goes through your book, even though uh, you describe a lot of the problems we are facing. Um, uh, you, you, you phrase it in any, like in crises, there are always hope, but there's always movement, could be movement forward. So the crisis is really big right now. And um, if there's, um, you even at some point, uh, you write that tr Trump's legacy could be that Europe is um, getting closer together and um, being more self-confident in moving forward. And I, I think if that's the legacy of this presidency, I will take it. Um, and we will see what Trump II uh, would mean for us. Um, uh, that's probably, we're going to talk about that. Um, and I also think it's a very challenging time for um, reading your book after the last uh, eight weeks um, of stay at home of all of us and the Corona crisis and how it all impacts um, transatlantic um, uh, relations, but also worldwide and globalization. Um, and we all know that the problems have not disappeared. We, only because there are no planes in the sky anymore about Washington DC, or almost no planes, climate change has not disappeared. The trade problems we had in the last two years with this administration did not disappear. We are still we are still wondering where the outer terrorists are, um, uh, the president threatened with. Um, so there are lots of things that, that will have to be addressed very soon, as soon as we try to get back to normal, um, or try to get back to the new normal in this crisis. Um, and one point that is also, I think, super um, important is um, the lack of trust um, we are facing right now, populism. The um, We have the anti-lockdown demonstrations of, on both sides of the Atlantic. I went to Richmond um, and saw armed protesters um, who used the, the impatience about the um, stay-at-home orders to protest against their own government uh, and the um, safer gun laws. And we have um, huge demonstrations on the last two weeks and weekend in, weekends in Germany, um, people who just um, protest against um, against any, any measures, who don't believe in, in the facts, who don't believe in science apparently, who don't want a vaccine uh, developed, uh, who thinks Bill Gates is, um, um, is, is behind all this. So conspiracy theories are really blooming right now, um, fueled, I think, by some governments. And um, Anthony, you write about this um, in, in the case of Brexit and um, the Trump administration and alternative facts and how that is used. Um, it might, might be even fueled, or is fueled by, by Russia. So there are huge challenges um, that are already um, um, and so pressing that the corona crisis is not making it easier to deal with. Um, and I think we just, with this, we just go into the discussion. Great, thanks so much. And, and let me just stay with you for a minute, Juliana, because questions are coming in. And, and one of the questions uh, is reacting to Ambassador Gardner's comment that we should be cooperating more with the European Union on the challenge of COVID-19. But this listener is saying, well, but isn't part of the problem that the European Union is not united? And you see these differences among the member states. And this, this um, listener said, maybe Kissinger has a point that the US doesn't know who to call when we're talking about the EU. Where do you see leadership coming from in Europe? I mean, I think we have a strong commission and um, uh, um, the president of the commission takes, takes a role, uh, me being German, um, uh, it's always talked about a lot about the German, uh, 
leading role of Germany? That's not an easy question for Germany, as you all know. But of course, we, um, I mean, we had an, a weak time of our government in the last years too. Um, uh, the, the populist party um, put a lot of pressure on politics. So um, it, it, it seemed that, that many countries in Europe and Germany um, had too much to do with internal problems to concentrate on the bigger problems. That is, that is true. But I think in, in dealing with health issues or financial issues, Brussels is the place um, uh, to deal and, and uh, uh, to deal with and to talk to. And um, I, there's probably not one number. And Anthony writes it in his book. There never will be one number because that's Europe, and Europe is complicated. But it's also um, uh, there's also a way of of dealing with the Commission. Uh, uh, if you take trade, you you deal with the Trade Commissioner. Um, if you if you if you talk about the cri financial crisis, you probably have to deal with. Um, uh, the Eurogroup. Um, so there are different numbers you can call, and um, Eurobin, I hope, um, will speak um, with uh, one voice in the future, but it will take a while, and it's not going to be the same as, as the US, and it never, it never was intended to be the same as the United States of America. It's a, it's a, it's a union of many sovereign states, and they will stay like this. And Juliana, I'm going to stay with you a minute. We've um, Tony is struggling to reconnect to us, so just so everyone's tracking that. Um, Juliana, let me draw you out on that a little more. I mean, you've had a front row seat on the difficulties in the US-EU relationship sitting here in the US. What do you think is at the core of the tension? between the Trump administration and the European Union? I, I concentrated more um, apparently on the, on the US um, government than on, on the European side in the last two years since I've been here. I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's both. It's a misunderstanding of Europe's role and strength. And it's also a very calculated understanding of a way to, to, to try to weak weaken um, the union. Um, I think the Trump administration, many in the Trump administration think that it's easier to deal with a single country than with a strong union. So there are, and they said it, um, Trump said it himself, that he, um, he, 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 he would like to see more uh, Great Britons, he would like to be see, see more, more Brexit, because he thinks he, it's easier for him to deal with a single country. Um, on the other side, there is a, um, even before Trump, there was um, there was anti-Americanism in Europe and, and, and in Germany, and we, we, and we have seen that with former administrations. And um, former administrations have criticized uh, um, Europeans for um, free riding or, or lack of burden sharing. So, um, also, I think the the the, the European um, 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 people, or the politicians, also have to do their job in in explaining why this relationship is indispensable. Why, why it is important and, and why even though America is not like not, not like us the same but but they are they are probably the best partner we can find and I think that's that's the thing we should also not take them for granted um, like with European Union um, we should emphasize how important this relationship is we should stress where there are problems and try to solve them but um, if, if you only criticize the, the other side you will not move forward Tony, welcome back. We've had several questions coming in about the role of the UK. And of course, you have lived and worked in London for many years. So I wanted to draw you out on the role that you see for the UK post-Brexit. And we also have one listener who said, and what would the implications of a successful Brexit be for the EU and for the transatlantic relationship? So just share with us more your thinking on Brexit. So after the referendum, uh, a lot of work was done um, in Washington about what the consequences of Brexit would be for the United States, for the EU, and for the UK although that last bit, the UK was perhaps the least relevant because of course that's up for the UK citizens to decide. Um, and the conclusion was that Brexit would be negative um, for Europe, for EU and for the United States. And I think we've been borne out in our analysis. And I discuss a lot of this in my chapter. 
And I use Boris Johnson as kind of the narrative thread for this chapter because I've known him for a long time and went to school with him. Um, and I'm rather critical of many of the arguments uh, about Brexit because they've proven to be uh, just inaccurate. Um, but the, the biggest difference in the way we've analyzed, we, we did analyze under the Obama administration how the Trump administration has seen Brexit is the following. Um, Karen, you remember, we always considered uh, the US-UK, UK-EU uh, and US-EU relationship to be three um, parts of a triangle and all three had to be solid in order to work effectively. This administration said only one uh, aspect of that relationship matters really, and that is the uh, US-UK relationship and the other two don't. Uh, the US-EU doesn't matter because we don't believe in the EU anymore. And the EU UK, well, doesn't really matter either. That's fundamentally uh, wrong and misguided because um, there are so many issues that uh, involve all three sides. Of course, we should hope that Brexit um, succeeds in the sense that the damage is limited and the UK thrives and we should look forward to having, continue to have a very strong relationship with the UK and that the UK remain fully engaged, uh, as engaged as possible with the EU, certainly on law enforcement and certainly on security, but not only. Um, it is certainly desirable that the UK have uh, proceed with an agreed, uh, an agreement with the EU that it doesn't crash out at the end of the year, even though that seems likely that, that it will. Um, if I had to consider one possible upside of the UK leaving, uh, that is uh, perhaps the following, that um, the UK, if it follows the path of being a rather less regulated, uh, less taxed um, jurisdiction, um, and will continue to be pro-transatlantic, um, will keep in check some of the worst um, you know, so some of the some of the worst impulses of the most of the countries in the EU that are most in favor of a high regulation and high tax, because the EU 27 can't afford to have um, a UK floating a few kilometers off the coast of the continent in, in that way. So it'll keep in check those impulses. Um, but the short answer I would say is that all three parts of that relationship have to work. And what's fascinating, particularly fascinating to me, is the interplay between a US-UK and a UK-EU free trade deal is there are trade-offs to be had, certainly for the UK and uh, for the US, uh, both strands are gonna be important and they have significant, inter you know, they interact in important ways. That's really interesting. Um, I wanna ask you now about your analysis of what's happening in the United States. And then Juliana, I, I wanna ask you to respond to this too, but we've had um, a couple of callers asking about the underlying support for a strong US-EU relationship. So the question is, is this fundamentally about a specific US president and an administration or is President Trump expressing more deeply held views of the American public? In other words, are you seeing an American public that is less interested in multilateral solutions to problems like climate? Uh, do you think this America first policy has deeper roots than simply one US president? Tony, do you wanna to speak to that? For sure, um, yes. Uh, it's not just Donald Trump. The roots obviously were there and we, many of us didn't, didn't see them um, until they emerged in such a dramatic way and they will be with us in the future. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and in fact, um, many of us from both parties uh, failed to see the backlash certainly against free trade. And that is gonna be a major part of the agenda going forward is how we continue to uh, advance the narrative, promote the narrative that um, that free trade is important, but free trade will have to be done in a different way because the losers, if you will, of globalization and free trade haven't been taken care of sufficiently. And I discuss this at some length in the trade chapter and also in conclusions. And together we can draw uh, out some lessons from the past. Uh, free trade will have to be done differently. And one of them much talked about, not really done, is free trade adjustment assistance failed on both sides of the Atlantic. So populism uh, has uh, certainly been there, but you know, I, I don't think I'm too optimistic in believing that the case can be made for multilateralism. 
um, for the institutions, including the uh, WTO. I don't think the case um, was made effectively. Certainly this administration has been undermining the case. The acid test for any administration, we've, many of us on the call have lived through this. The acid test is, are we promoting the interests of the countries we represent, period. Are we promoting the interests of our exporters and our, um, you know, our, our businesses? Um, this administration clearly hasn't, you know, even on free trade, that's the acid test. Uh, when we fail to get a TTIP agreement and this administration has undermined it and the EU signs a deal with Canada, well, what happens? We should, we should, we should explain it. You know, the Canadian exporters are benefited vis-a-vis -vis American exporters. When we withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement and the 11 other countries continue with it, minus some important provisions, well, they benefit vis-a-vis -vis American exporters. Um, when the EU signs free trade agreements with Japan and Vietnam and with Singapore and other countries, well, their exporters benefit. Now, how does any of that actually uh, advance U.S. interests? That's the argument. The U.S. has to lead. It has to uh, has to be a player, um, and it's important that we make the case that multilateralism isn't an erosion of sovereignty, as the Brexiteers like to argue, or as Donald Trump likes to argue. It actually promotes U.S. interests, but we do have to acknowledge that reform is necessary. So just to conclude, I mean, of all the things I would like to see done, if we're lucky enough to have a Biden administration, is the U.S. and the EU actually to sit down, uh, as we haven't done, unfortunately, to reform these, some of these institutions, including the WTO. And we can do that. And together, yes, together, we actually have the leverage necessary to bring China to the table. This administration thinks it doesn't need the EU to deal with China. I think that's a mistake because the EU has enormous leverage because of its single market. And we should, we should get on with the job. And a specific follow-up, do you think there will be a trade war between the U.S. and the EU before the election? Do you think President Trump would launch something like that? Uh, I really, obviously, I don't know. I suspect he's got his hands full now with a really fast deteriorating situation with, with China. If he wins in the, the second term, um, I certainly wouldn't exclude that, that his, his attention will turn back to Europe. Uh, because after all, that truce that was uh, announced with great fanfare, the Rose Garden, is uh, becoming a little dated. You know, not much has been done. Of course, uh, you know, soybeans and LNG export volumes have gone up, but that was happening anyway. Nothing really has been done, and the deficit with Europe continues. The only thing this administration cares about is the goods deficit. It doesn't care about the services surplus the U.S. has, doesn't care about what's called affiliate income, income that U.S. companies in Europe uh, generate and bring back to the United States. So in the round, actually, the trade relationship isn't nearly as bad as he is pretending, but he doesn't care about that. He just cares about the goods deficit and he'll want to do something about it. So I think, you know, car import tariffs will be still on the agenda and um, he's probably still angry with the EU uh, and will invoke more, you know, he'll invoke more unilateral tariffs based on national security exemption. So I. I think in a second term, it would get worse. Juliana, your perspective on this. I think um, Trump lives, um, uh, he uses the threat, like take the, the auto tariffs. Um, he, he likes to have it on the table. So um, I share the, the, the opinion that this, this might stay on the agenda for a little while, if, especially if he wins the second, uh, the second term. Um, I think um, this administration, because you asked if this is solely um, um, because of the Trump administration, this administration is a challenge um, to, to any partner, I think, uh, in the world um, uh, in, in a positive way, uh, frame, put it in a positive way, it's a challenge. Um, the problems will not disappear uh, if the Biden administration uh, comes to power. I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure, but some problems will disappear, I, I, we hope. Um, um, I also think it's a generational rift um, uh, that the younger people are more like, like um, I hope even even like also in the US are more open to to international institution to multilateral cooperation than 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 older ones who who have who have seen um, different times. So um, I think there's like. I, I, I think there's hope moving forward that the younger ones are more interested in, 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 in exchange and, and cooperation. I think China is an interesting point. China might be um, something, I think the US is very much united about how to confront China and China is a problem. And Europe seems to be um, catching up 
a little bit more with this assumption. So China might be uh, a really a, play, a playing field where, where we could work much better together than alone. Um, Trump apparently is trying it alone, but um, any administration after November um, could could see that there's 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 an advantage of doing it together um, on, on both sides. Um, um, putting this relationship first, and then um, the, the, one, the one between uh, Europe and, and the states, and then um, confronting the emerging power China, the emerging world power, sorry. <laughs> well, let's stay with China for a minute, because several of our listeners want to bring China more squarely into our conversation. And they're noting that the vacuum that the United States has left in terms of not spearheading a global response to the pandemic has in many cases been filled by China and Russia. They note the protective equipment that the Chinese sent to Europe very quickly. They note that in Italy, the senior Italian officials were all lauding China's help and the lack of solidarity in Europe. So from where, Tony, let me start with you. It seems as though there's a bipartisan consensus in the United States that is much more critical of China today than it was in the Obama administration. Tony, do you think that Europe, that the European Union needs to choose between the United States and China? Um, they'll never choose. We shouldn't ask them to choose for for many reasons. You know, if you were a European sitting in Europe, um, you're going to have to have, you know, certainly good trade relations with China. Certainly, the exporting, the major exporting countries of the EU, uh, Germany, but not just, uh, will need to ensure that they have access to that market. That, by the way, has sprung back uh, faster uh, in this crisis than others. So they will not want to be asked to choose and we can't force them to choose, nor is it necessary to choose. Um, you mentioned that uh, Europe is, uh, some European countries have been lauding China. Well, that's true, but the shine has come off pretty quickly, Karen, you know, not only because some of that protective equipment has turned out to be faulty, but there's been a lot of blowback uh, against some rather aggressive Chinese diplomacy. Um, and many of the people on the call will, will follow this in, in detail. Um, you know, aggressive diplomacy in the sense of uh, instructing the uh, European External Action Service about what it should or shouldn't say, uh, in particular reports about China. Um, some very tough language in France, um, even blaming uh, the French um, and propagating some, some fake news about the, um, the sources of the virus. So you know, the shine has come off, but even more more importantly, I've noticed a huge shift in the EU in the last couple of years with regard to China, and we've seen it, uh, particularly in the so-called geopolitical commission that uh, Ursula von der Leyen has now put forward. And, and that's translated into some very specific uh, policies that I think are um, really the right policies. In economic policy, it means perhaps being less naive. Uh, and saying that access to the single market should be conditional. Uh, it shouldn't be necessarily open to anyone on any terms. It means foreign direct investment is tightening. Uh, well, at the EU level, it's more of a screening mechanism, but member states are, are implementing many of them tougher um, screening of FDI. Uh, competition rules are being changed. Anti-subsidy rules are being changed. Um, access to the public procurement market now has been changed because of an important piece of legislation. All of those things are not specifically targeted against China, but I think have China as, as a major you know, country in mind. Um, so uh, I think it's to a certain extent the EU has, has grown up about the kind of risk that China poses um, to, uh, to economic uh, dominance, uh, to the fact that there's unfair playing field. And that we need to work together with the United States, the EU and the United States have to work together, as we should, to make sure it's our rules that are written, uh, you know, worldwide in standards. It means making sure that Chinese don't dominate important organizations like uh, International Telecommunications Union or WIPO, uh, where there's huge uh, ability to, to write the rules uh, in a way that will favor exporters from the countries that do write the rules. You know, in the foreign affairs article that Joe Biden wrote, many of the people on the call will have read, um, 
the candidate uh, spends a lot of time talking about um, how the United States should return to a position of leadership in writing the rules of global trade. And that's even more important that the economic uh, consequences of promoting trade. That's what we tried to do in TPP. That's what we were trying to do in TTIP uh, and we failed, but we should go back to that. The short answer therefore is that there is an agenda where we should be working together, but not forcing the EU to choose sides, but we need to join forces if we're gonna have any hope of making sure that the world that we're gonna live in, in the next couple decades and maybe even beyond is a world that enshrines our values. So Juliana, what's your perspective on how China affects this relationship? I also think it's it wouldn't be good to ask to be to, to, to choose, but I think we can be asked to prioritize um, uh, the relationship. And um, um, I, I also think that uh, I, I would prefer um, rules that that we made to rules that China, communist China makes. So, um, um, but you have to explain it better. We have to um, we have of course that you cannot separate. You cannot um, stop the trade with China. Um, uh, we, are, we are dependent on, on, on this trade, but um, you can, if you stick together and if you stand as one block, you have a, a much much better leverage in in in, in, um, in issues uh, like like the, the reform of the World Trade Organization. Um, today, I mean, we have the the meeting of the World Health Organization and, and the question of um, um, the, the influence China is is taking in this institution. Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I don't, I'm not sure if uh, the Trump administration will will, will still fund uh, the World, World Health Organization. But um, I think we need it, um, and we need it in a reformed way. So um, I I would always say we have to try to find a way to do it together with um, the United States. Um, that that gives us much better, much um, st stronger leverage uh, than we would have on our own. Juliana, let me stay with you for a minute. And, and Tony, I want your perspective then on this too. But a couple of our listeners are saying, okay, we've talked a little bit about the disaffection in the United States with the European Union, but let's also reflect on the disaffection among Europeans with the United States. And that this process started before Donald Trump and is likely to extend beyond him. So when you, Tony mentioned Ursula von der Leyen's geopolitical commission, and another listener mentioned, look, it's not necessarily obvious if this is good for the US. You know, if the EU is seeking to become better equipped and more capable to pursue its own interests, which maybe are not always aligned with the US, this could add to transatlantic conflict. So help us understand this underlying disaffection that you see in many European countries toward the United States. I think one one point is is, is the burden sharing aspect, and um, and um, to answer that question that, that point quickly, I think um, I think this country, the U.S., uh, would be would welcome it very much if, if some of the burdens uh, it has it has to carry uh, would, would be carried by the Europeans. Um, uh, I, I can I probably know more about Germany than most of the other countries in Europe. So I would say, in, in take take the example of the, of defense spending, and it, even so, I think um, uh, the NATO NATO states, European NATO states, have understood that they have to do more and invest more in their own security and defense. Um, it is still difficult in explaining it to the German um, public. It's, it will still be a huge debate if defense spending goes up, especially now after Corona or in Corona times. But it, that's the job the polit our government and the politicians have to do. I mean, there is no excuse in not having done it the last uh, last years, not having done it enough. You have to explain it. That's, that's the job of a politician. You have to explain it every single day if it's necessary. Why we think it's necessary to be to be able to to to, to, care, to care for our security. And I understand that, uh, that the United States are sometimes impatient uh, with um, what they call free riding attitude of Europeans who just um, um, trust in that the United States are going to, to, to take care of us. Um, and this has changed. And, um, but of course, as I said, the Trump administration is a challenge. I mean, if you hear him saying things that we are worse than China and and uh, that he wants to destroy the EU, it's hard to, to find common ground. I mean, especially in Germany, um, people are listening very much to what he is tweeting. That might be a problem. Um, and we 
I notice as a correspondent how, how big the interest is in whatever we are writing and whatever we are covering. So the interest in what this country is doing, which is supposed to be our closest friend and ally, um, is huge. And, and that's why the disappointment um, uh, is, is even bigger when this country does not behave, we think um, it should behave. Yeah? And, and, and when you see um, um, distrust in science and then you see populism and, uh, and even hostile attitudes towards, towards uh, our country and our, our union. Uh, um, so um, there's a lot of damage to be repaired in any, any future administrations. Um, but as I said, we also have to look to ourselves and, and uh, find out what we could do better and why we have to, where we have to grow up. And Germany cannot excuse uh, itself with um, the war that is 70 years ago um, anymore. Um, uh, we have to, if we, we are a strong and a big country and an economic powerhouse, so we have to take responsibility. And um, that probably makes it easier for everyone in the future to work together. Super, thanks. And Tony, let me draw you into this conversation about disaffection within Europe about US leadership. You certainly experienced some of that when you were there. How do you see that playing out? And then where do you see leadership in Europe coming from? Is it a geopolitical European commission? Is it Franco-German cooperation? So over to you, Tony. Well, so that, that's obviously a, re a really important point that uh, disaffection didn't start with Donald Trump. Uh, we've had moments of crisis and disaffection before. I mentioned one of them. You know, there's an anecdote I recount in the book. The first week of my job, I was walking around my new neighborhood and I saw a big uh, advertisement for Carlsberg beer. And the advertisement said, um, Carlsberg beer unhacked by the NSA since 1847. And I said, oh my God, you know, um, this has now become part of public discourse, right? This is gonna be a major issue. You know, Houston, we have a problem. Um, and it was really big. I, I faced some pretty tough um, discussions at the European Parliament and the European Commission. Um, so, you know, he, it, disaffection didn't start before, but it certainly has deepened. And, and, you know, this tension that you mentioned, Karen, has always been there, right? We live through it. The tension between, uh, well, we want a Europe that agrees with us. <laughs> we want a Europe that supports us. Uh, and if we support European integration, oh my God, we may have a, a unified Europe that actually has different policies. Well, my answer to that is, you know what? That's what partnership means. If you want a poodle, you don't want a partner, right? Uh, partners actually sometimes disagree. My argument would be that when you look at, at it in the round, uh, a, Europe, a united Europe, an, an EU, a geopolitical EU is um, going to disagree with us in some matters, but on the whole is actually going to agree with us on, I would say, the vast majority of issues. And I discussed in my book, you know, the global issues, the regional issues. Um, in some areas, like on Israel policy, we'll probably disagree, but, you know, that's, that's uh, perhaps the price. Um, on the issue of the military is not a classic example. They always, always, and there always will be the same concerns that somehow the EU's mission, its security mission, is going to undermine the bedrock of, of um, you know, the Atlantic uh, relationship being NATO. I'd have never believed that. I don't think it's the case. Uh, here in Britain, I've seen so many articles uh, in the Brexit tabloids saying that somehow the EU is going to create an, a, uh, an, an army that seeks to replace NATO. None of that, I think, is true. Uh, and much of what the EU is doing is actually positive and complementary. So I'm a believer that this is complementary and, uh, and, and not competitive. So Tony, let me stay with you and, and Juliana, I'm gonna ask for your perspective on this as well. If you take out your crystal ball and think about the next US administration, and we don't know if it's going to be a second term for Donald Trump or if it will be a Biden administration. But let's for the moment postulate that even if it's a second term for Trump, there might be some areas where President Trump could see US-EU cooperation serving his America first interests. So if there's a Venn diagram, tell me the three issues you think it could overlap in a second Trump term. And then also, if you think that Joe Biden could be elected, then what are the three key issues you would encourage a President Biden to move out on immediately to try to improve 
the US-EU relationship. So Tony, first to you. So absolutely right. Look, it, there hasn't been, you know, simply damage. There are some areas of cooperation which we should recognize. Um, for example, um, on energy security, I think this administration has identified quite rightly that we should support Europe's efforts to become more energy secure. And we've done a lot in that respect, um, particularly in infrastructure and supporting the Three Seas Initiative, which is, uh, which is an initiative by a number of countries, particularly in Central Eastern Europe. Uh, and beyond. Um, so that would continue in a second term, uh, and it's important. Um, the second would be law enforcement, and it, it goes on. It's uh, not the front page news, uh, but the administration has identified quite rightly that the EU institutions, in addition to the member states, have key assets to bring to bear. And why wouldn't we work with the EU to combat serious crime and terrorism? And now the EU also has this important initiative on anti-money laundering, which is going to be critical. Um, so those are two areas. Um, I would struggle, frankly, to identify many other areas where the administration sees the EU as a major partner. Um, a Biden administration would go back in many ways to what we'd been seeking to do uh, before January 20, 2017. And there's a lot of stuff that could be done, I think, quickly. I mentioned a few of them. I would like to see us engage again, as we were, on a number of these plurilateral trade agreements. You know, investment services on environmental goods agreement. Uh, I would like to see us sit down again. It's perhaps not the uh, the most immediate and sexiest topic, but it's on uh, WTO reform, which is longer term but fundamental. Um, I would like us to settle the Boeing Airbus dispute, which you know has gone on for far too long, uh, and uh, I think is um, is uh, counterproductive. Uh, I would like us to unblock uh, immediately. I think we can. A lot of these you know, technical but important uh, sanitary and phytosanitary disputes that prevent the EU and the United States from selling um, uh, farm goods to each other uh, and is a major reason, by the way, why the United States is running a, uh, a trade deficit with, with the EU. I think we could move right away on, sounds technical, but very important, on regulatory cooperations, but specifically in non-safety car standards. We didn't get very far on safety standards for a whole bunch of rather boring issues, but we can do a lot on non-safety standards. And then, um, you know, coronavirus, this president has no, no intention of cooperating with the EU. We should immediately. Um, on climate change, another good example, big difference. We would immediately cooperate with the EU on that. EU-NATO cooperation, pick up where we were and push ahead, very important topic. Iran nuclear agreement, that's another point of, uh, of difference. Um, and on sanctions and, and well, China, we've already mentioned. Um, so a much broader agenda, but you're right, Karen, I think what's really gonna be challenging here is that there will be so much wreckage on the ground should Joe Biden win. Uh, we're gonna have to be brutally honest and say, uh, you know, how much of this wreckage can we fix and how much can be fixed in say four years? Um, and really uh, prioritize what things can be done quickly um, and so the list of priorities will be short, and I think trade should be one of them. Super, thanks, Tony. Juliana, your perspective. I think most of it was already said. I think one, one important thing will be um, for, for the future administration is how, how, how the majorities are in Congress, because as we all know, uh, the president cannot act on uh, act itself. So if uh, Joe Biden has a, 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 not a majority um, uh, in, in Congress, it's going to be difficult to, to, um, uh, to change it. And I mean, take, take Iran, uh, and I, I'm not sure um, uh, it's easy to, to go back to the, to the, to the treaty um, that, that the Trump administration left. I think climate change, of course, is, is, is a point that's extremely important to Europeans to come back to, and this will not happen with the Trump administration because many Many of them apparently don't think there is a climate change. Um, um, I also have not, a, not my, my fantasy is not really big in imagining what kind of uh, common ground we are going to find in the second administration. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit afraid it gets worse. I'm, I'm afraid we go back to the threatening of, um, uh, of um, increasing tariffs and uh, um, putting America first and um, um, perhaps they prove me wrong, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, um, but I guess many in Europe hope that um, uh, 
that, that this administration will change um, and uh, uh, is going to see the, prof the, the benefits of, of um, having multilateral, multi multilateral um, cooperation again, uh, not less. And as we, uh, I think the, the, the fear is big that um, Trump is like, totally um, um, leading the world, world Health Organization uh, for long, um, that he's not uh, trying to reform WTO, um, that he's um, seeking trade agreements with single countries and, uh, and not with uh, the European Union um, or other bigger um, entities. So um, I think the cooperation will has to be has to get better, but I'm only seeing it with a new administration. So one of our listeners raises a very good point, which is that we in this conversation have been focused on the relationship between the U.S national government, the Trump administration, and the European Union, or the Obama administration in the EU. And he's pointing out that the European Union also deals directly with individual US states. And then in areas like climate change, we've seen quite productive cooperation between the EU and the alliance of US states that are moving forward still on the Paris Climate Agreement goals. So. I'd like to draw you both out on the impact of this subnational cooperation and what sort of a future you see for that subnational cooperation. Tony, let's start with you. Yeah, it's a super important point. Of course, only the federal government can, um, you know, is competent for foreign affairs in our constitutional order. But, and I mentioned this in my chapter on climate change. Um, Absolutely, given the um, empty chair policy of the United States in the last three years, quite rightly, the EU has identified states, obvious ones being California, but not, not only, um, uh, for their leadership on, on climate and not just states, but cities, as you quite rightly said, Los Angeles and New York and Boston and others. Uh, and the Council of Mayors has played an important role. Um, that, will, uh, that will continue. Um, but climate is sort of a is very specific area here because um, the states do have uh, power. Many they can do many things in their powers, everything from fuel efficiency to certain standards, um, which, by the way, are being attacked by this administration. Uh, but they do have powers to set policy and uh, also have emissions trading. Um, in a Biden administration, I think the federal government would be back into the center of uh, in, in, in the frame. I can't identify many other areas though, Karen, where uh, states and cities uh, would have as deep a relationship on those kind of uh, global or you know, transatlantic issues uh, as, in, as, in, as in climate change. Juliana? I think that's, that's, that's um, the cities um, I wanted to mention too, as you can, you can work with best practice examples, for example. Um, I don't know if you, if you might look at trade and how um, states or regions or cities attract um, investments um, from each other, um, even though there is a trade conflict going on, there's still, of course, um, companies investing on the other side of, of the Atlantic. Um, but that is not like, that is not a governmental approach. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a private sector approach, but there's, of course, lots of cooperation going on. Um, uh, luckily, um, uh, even when Washington is blocked, uh, um, um, so I think that would be my thought on that. Well, the most important job of the moderator is to end us on time. So much as I would love to keep this conversation going, and I have to tell you, there are 65 questions in the question and answer queue. So we really could keep on going for the rest of the day and I would love it, but I wanna be respectful of Tony's time and Juliana's time and all of you who joined us for this session. So thank you for the wonderful participation. Tony and Juliana, so appreciate your sharing your perspectives. And Tony, I'm gonna challenge everyone on this call to prove your daughter wrong, that books about the European oh. Union do not sell. So let's all order Tony's book. And I know we will be the better for it and we certainly will be smarter for having read it. So we wish you high book sales, Tony. Juliana, thank you so thank much for lending your perspective to this conversation.
And with that, I wish everyone a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you, so, thank you Karen. Thank you, Joanne. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.